All right, folks, back in the Boston Man Show, Atlanta Hamilton, coach of the Florida State Seminoles in 19th year, coming up here. Season starts November 25th. Coach Hamilton, how life in Tallahassee, man? I tell you what, uh, we're doing just fine. We kind of hunk it down in our own little bubble, you know, trying to maintain, staying focused, trying to stay safe. Our guys are very disciplined, and it seems as though we're in a pretty good place now. So I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm glad and proud that our guys are, uh, seem to be focused, and we hope we can stay that way. Coach, I'm going to take you back some time, man. You know, I, I went to Tennessee State University off the air. I'm, I'm a TSU Tiger from Nashville, man. So, tell us about your time at UT, UT Martin, one of the rivals. Back then, it was the, it was the Pacers, not the Skyhawks. But tell us about your time in Martin, Tennessee, and how that was then transitioned to being at Austin P. It's Coach Austin P. right after you got through playing at, at UT Martin there. Well, that was a unique experience for me because I was the first black a- a basketball player to play at UT Martin. In those days, uh, you know, it was somewhat challenging. You know, I, I went through the era uh, in segregation, and uh, during that time, I was always integrating this about everywhere I went. And so there were some bumps in the road, but I, I really, really cherished those uh, experiences that I enjoyed at UT Martin. And I, I thought that uh, the, the way we conducted ourselves there opened up some more doors for people who look like us. Um, uh, but uh, with each one of those challenges that I had to overcome, um, you know, I think, I think it made me a stronger person, uh, created uh, a, a philosophy that I think I still stick with today. So, you know, uh, I really enjoyed it. I thought it was good for me. It's interesting how God will put you in situations where they say he won't give you more than you can bear. But I think I was good for that situation. And I also think that situation was very good for me. Yes, Coach, how was it playing in those days, man, being the on, on, so only black ball player at UT Martin? And, you know, Martin's a very small town, you know, for Tennessee. You know, not very many people like us out in Martin. So how was it for you trying to adjust and be out there and be who you are, true to who you are, and know what you, the goals you had in mind out there? Well, my goals were consistent when I got there. I, I knew it was important that I get my degree because it was important for me to sit at the table for my brothers and my sisters. And obviously, I was the first person to go to college out of my family. <clears throat> and in order for me, uh, it was important that I got my degree because my mother and father always told me. My father, my Alert mother, from my updates mother, ready to install. Sorry about that. <laughs> I, got to, I got to cut the computer off. But my, my mother went to the seventh grade. My father went to the ninth grade. And they always felt that they had a ceiling where they could not progress past a certain level. And so that was always on me about getting my education so I could have a better way of life. And I also felt the stress and the pressure of getting my degree so that I could set the table for my brother. So when I, once I graduated from UT Martin and went to Austin P, I I adopted my brother with it. And he got to college and he went to college. He married a girl from, that went, he went to college with and both his kids went to college. I adopted my brother Barry he went to college. I adopted my brother. I mean, I didn't adopt my brother John, but because we he was too old, but he went to college. His kids go to college, and they marry somebody who went to college. In other words, my, I adopted my sister Pam. She goes to college, and her kid goes to school. So it changed the whole culture of a family. So having an opportunity to get away from North Carolina, get out on my own, get focused, and, and try to accomplish something in, in an isolated situation like what UT Martin was for me, it, it, it was challenging. But I thought it was what I needed, and I thought it really helped my entire family, the fact that I was able to go and take that first step. Coach, I feel you, I feel you man, because, you know, for me, I'm my grandmother's first grandchild to graduate from college from TSU. So I know what that means. So now kids behind me see, well, J.R. made it. He got him a, a master's degree as well and his radio job. So we can do it too. So I feel like, you know, me going to college, getting my two degrees it will help my family down the road grow and keep that chain, like you said, Coach, keep that chain going, give people, understand, hey, the college degree is very important to us to be successful and allows us black people in this world as, as we matriculate from 2020 onwards. Well, it, it was back in those days, uh, it prior to me going to to uh, UT Martin, you know, an era before integration, you know, drink, drink, using the colored water fountain, the colored bathroom, in many ways having to set up in the balcony and not being able to go to the movies that you want to, not eating at certain restaurants, you develop a, a certain mindset that, that you want a better way of life for yourself and, and for your family. And so, so 
it didn't really matter what challenges that I had at UT Martin. The, the focus of wanting to do something that was meaningful for my family was so much greater than the obstacles and the challenges that really, to be very honest with you, I didn't see them as challenges. I just saw them as bumps in the road. Yes, indeed. And Coach, you were from UC, UC Martin, Austin P as, as a coach. So at what point in your career at Martin did you realize that you want to get into coaching? Well, to be very honest with you, people don't know my story, but I actually became frustrated for a moment at Austin P. I was there for three years and I had coach with, with the kids that, that I was able to, to bring to the program. I thought I had made a major contribution. And, and God had given me a certain level of confidence that sometimes I look back at my career, I, I don't want to say it was cockiness, but I, I was confident. I felt that I had learned and grown and, my, and we were having so much success. Matter of fact, you, if you go back and look, we played University of Kentucky from Austin Peay uh, in, in, in Nashville in the NCAA Regional Tournament. And we, we, we lost to Kentucky 106, 103, a double overtime game. So from Austin P to playing the winners program in the history of college basketball in Nashville, Tennessee, was a tremendous accomplishment for the team that went from last in the league to, you know, to competing for a national title. And so as time would have it, the head coach became uh, very popular and he was getting mentioned for other Power Five type jobs. At 23, uh, did I lose you? No, no, you're your coach. I'm with you. At, 20, at 23, I walked into the president's office. And <laughs> I can't believe I did this and asked him, was I going to be the next head coach at Austin P if Lake Kelly got a job? And, and to this day, no, I wasn't 23, I was 26. At 26 years old, I walked into the president's office to ask him if Lake Kelly gets one of these jobs, am I going to be the next head coach? When needless to just say, there weren't very many head coaches, African American head coaches in the country, period. And what gave me the level of confidence to walk into the president's office to ask him that, to this day, I find almost uh, 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 humorous. Because, but I felt I was qualified. There was no hesitation on my part. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and he told me, he said, Leonard, I hired you, and nothing would make me happier than to be the head coach at the Austin Peay. But I resigned in two years, and, and he said that I'm not real sure that, my, that I'm strong enough uh, to, in this day and time, to make that happen. Well, what he was saying is, I interpreted, he never said I was not going to get the job because I was black. But I, I understood exactly what he said because I had a great relationship with, with the president. And I became frustrated. He told me that on Wednesday. I resigned on Thursday and moved out of my house on Friday and took a job with Dow Chemical in Charlotte, North Carolina on Monday. Wow. And see, and, and, and now, now, I tell that story because sometimes, you know, that, that, that's, the, that's the way the devil works. The devil created that moment of frustration in me to try to discourage me from doing what I'm doing now. Now, you know, there's a big difference in selling chemicals and, and then being the head coach at, or being the associate coach at Kentucky, head coach at Oklahoma State, Miami, NBA, Florida State. Now, so the devil w was messing with me. But, but I've always told people, I've always had this hedge of protection around. Even when I tried to mess up, God wouldn't let me mess up. He always just kind of nudged me back. So I go to work on Monday, and, 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 and they sent me out to find an apartment Monday afternoon. John C. Smith was trying to convince me to take the head job there, and I went over there to let them know that I, was, I wasn't interested. And, and at lunchtime, the head coach from the University of Kentucky had called the hotel looking for me. And so wow. Wow. I called back to the hotel. My wife told me that Joe Hall, the head coach of Kentucky, had called. And... Uh, and I called him on the phone, and the conversation went like this. He said, Leonard, do you, would you be interested in talking to me about a uh, position on my staff? I said, sure, Coach. He said, how about coming in to see me on Wednesday? I said, Coach, let me call you back. He said, because I won't be back until late Tuesday afternoon. I called the airport and made my own plane reservations. <laughs> and I called him back, and I told him, how about me flying in every night? I'll see you when you get back on Tuesday. And uh, let's visit if that's okay with you. He said, fine. So I made my own reservation. I flew in the <laughs> in the Lex, Kentucky on Monday night, visiting him 
when he got back on, on Tuesday, and about three or four o'clock in the afternoon after we visited, I said, Coach, <laughs> you have anything else you want to talk to me about? And he says, I'm, I'm fine, Levin, if you are. So I say, tell you four things. Um, I, I will never get you in trouble. I'll be loyal. Nobody outwork me, and you have plenty of players. I said, but if you're not going to offer me the job, I'm going back to Charlotte, if you don't mind, because I want to be the number one chemical salesman in the country. And, and, and I got a plane and went back to uh, Charlotte. But, but he, the devil was working on me because I was still hurt. I was disappointed. I mean, it was painful, the experience of knowing that I could not be the head coach at Austin P because I was African-American. And, and, I, and I lost emotional control. And I always say in life, you have to have emotional intelligence. And sometimes in life, you get frustrated and you make those ir irrational decisions. And that yes, might sir. have been one. But God, here again, he had another plan for me. You know, I, he had another purpose for me to fulfill. And so the next Monday, at lunch, as I was supposed to move out of my hotel into an apartment, so I called and offered me the job during my lunch break, where at Dow Chemical, everybody went to lunch at the same time. And I was standing across the street at Howard Johnson. I walked back, I told him, yes, I take the job. I walked across the street and said, to whom this may concern, I resign my position effectively immediately. Thank you very much for the opportunity. <laughs> and I jumped in my car and drove to Lexington, Kentucky. So my point to you, I'm doing what I think I'm on, on, put on earth to do. I mean, I enjoy working with young people, taking them from teenagers to young adulthood. Uh, to me, that's more important than the wins and losses. Uh, they, that's what you guys read about. That's what you talk about. But if all I do is win games and and go to the NCAA tournament and 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 and, and don't take care of the kids who are looking to me for leadership. Then, then what what have I done? You know, what have I done in life? Is this more important than developing husbands and fathers and neighbors and, and fine citizens like your friend Pierre Jordan? I'm so I'm so proud of him because he's a perfect example of a guy coming to school, getting his degree, uh, conducting himself properly, moving on in life, and, and getting the most out of what God has blessed him, the talent God has blessed him with. So, from that standpoint. I'm happy. I enjoy what I do. Uh, I told somebody yesterday, as long as I don't come out of the locker room and get sitting on the other coach's bench by mistake, because I don't know where I am, I'm going to hang on in here. And yes, indeed, Coach. You know, I feel you, man. Like you said, Coach, I feel like not enough in the media to not focus on how you all as coaches help young men grow. I know for me, being around Frank, 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 Frankie Allen, Sal Alexander, helped me in my life, in my career. Being around Coach Randy Peel, been around people like that, has really inspired me. Because even now, they talk to me about life and it's how it helped me. Even when I'm not playing ball, I was ready over, but it's still, it's the lessons are the same. Lewis Preston. So, guys, I mean, you all mean so much to us young men who play for you all and around you because you all, you have your parents, you have your coaches. So, your coach tells you something, you'll listen to that because coach <laughs> trusts and believes in you. So, if coach tells you, you're going to do it. Well, let me ask you this were you any good? Uh, no, nah, not really, Coach. <laughs> <laughs> hey, co Coach, that's why I'm a radio, Coach. <laughs> so, 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 what position did you play? I was a, I was a five tier guard, man, trying to make it, man, just trying to make it. I was a, a shoot shooter. I will give you effort on defensive end. I will try my best, Coach. Try to make my rotations, but hey, I was just trying to play hard, man, make a difference when I could. So, 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 other words, you saying that uh, you was a, a Support, uh, rotation support play. Yes, yeah. If you need a, a zone bus, a three-point shooter, or keep some energy effort, hey, that's me. <laughs> yeah, you kept the great point average of the team up pretty, pretty good, too, right? <laughs> yeah, most definitely. <laughs> yeah, business degree for carry him and the coach. <laughs> well, you, you you served your purpose, but you know, everybody has a role, and uh, you filled your role pretty good. Now, I'm proud of you. Look where you are now. Yes, sir. Hey, coach, sit around the games, sit around, see, get to talk to guys like yourself, man, and enjoy life and cover basketball and football. So, man, Lord bless me, man. I found my niche in this world here. Now, now, so now tell me about your format there at the station. 
Well, Coach, the format here is very much for a variety, Coach. You know, we have sports shows, politics shows. Mine's one of the sports shows. So recently, I talked about politics as well. We have people get ready to vote here in Georgia. So we have a variety of things. We are here in Dallas, Georgia. Out here in the suburbs of Atlanta. So, man, we have a lot of things going on out here. Black-owned station out here as well, Coach. So we're trying to get into our community, get people registered to vote, get people understand about the census as well. So, man, we're trying to grow this thing, Coach, the right way. In fact, like our, our community the right way, Coach. Well, man, now tell me this. Why can't y'all show a brother down in Tallahassee a little more love than what y'all showing me? I mean, you know, I've been down here 18 years. It's the first time you had me on the show. Now tell me what's up with that. Hey, Coach, hey, I'll, I'll take the blame for that, man. Hey, I'm doing, I'm going to make it right here going forward, Coach. I trust and believe me. We'll have you on the show as much as we need to. All right. Hey, you know, I, I'm, feeling, I'm feeling some kind of way. You know my guy, Pierre Jordan, <laughs> uh, one of my guys. You went to school in Tennessee Martin. You know, I tried to hire Silas when uh, – when, uh, no, not Silas. Uh, and I know Frankie very well. Um, so so my, but my point to you is that you, you got to show me a little bit more love. I do things the right way. You know, I, I, I try to stay, I try to represent, and, and you guys don't show brother no love, you know? Hey, Coach, yeah. hey, hey, it's, it's, today it changes, Coach. Today it changes. I, I guarantee you that. <laughs> we'll make sure you give this show what you need to, Coach, because you, know, you, you play our, you play Georgia Tech here, I know that as well. So I know you and Josh Pass have some good battles as well, man. So I, I, I know, uh, I would see you guys come here to the McCamish Pavilion and, and show the text to some real, real nice over, over there, man. Well, I tell you what, Josh has done an outstanding job with that program. I'm very proud of what he's done, and and he's right there on the cusp of uh, making it to the NCAA tournament. Matter of fact, we played Josh the first uh, ACC conference game. He has that little matchup zone defense, and you know I was watching the game the other night, and we struggled with that thing here last year. You know I'm gonna have to do a little better job. I, you know I don't <laughs> I don't I don't have a I don't, I don't have those. I've got three guys going to get drafted in the NBA this year. Maybe I need to bring them back for that first game because, you know, <laughs> they helped me out a little bit. But, you, know, you know, most of a lot of our players come from the Atlanta area. Um, MJ Walker, uh, probably our most experienced player returning this year. We expect him to have an outstanding year. Tony Douglas, uh, uh, Chris Singleton, uh, now Devin Vassells, uh, who's going to be a lottery pick in the draft. He's from Atlanta. Uh, some of our better players always come from that area, and so I need to have a little more of a presence, you know. And hey, by the way, you know, you know, I, you know, I do gospel music too, man. I didn't know that, coach. Yeah, I didn't know that. Hey, I learned some new today, coach. Doc, hey, we need to play yeah, some of the show I, here. I, now I got, I got, I got uh, a gospel music label, and maybe you might want, <clears throat> you might want to play a little something, something on the radio. They a little, a little marching music, you know, a little something that it lift up your spirits when you have some of those down moments. Yes, sir. Hey, Coach, we'll definitely get that done for you as well, Coach. I was asking you about the count. It's about my next point here, Coach. Recruiting Atlanta is something you've always done, even just at Miami, uh, also in Florida State, because you've been in 19 years. So how important is it to come here and get talent? Because everybody can't go to Georgia Tech in Georgia, of course. So I saw much talent here, Coach, here all the time with our Peace Jams or Lake Point. So what's, what's, what's important about the AU program in Atlanta if you find good talent into your pipeline and make sure your, your squad is good every year? You know, someone, uh, you know, uh, Charlton Young worked at Georgia Tech for a number of years. And uh, as a matter of fact, his parents lived in, um, in Atlanta. He, 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 he has this saying, it's somewhat true, there's a bas there's an NBA player on every corner <laughs> in Atlanta. You know, he said, he said, like churches, liquor stores, and NBA players, they're on every corner. <laughs> <laughs> That's an inside joke, okay? But oh, yeah. uh, on a serious standpoint, um, uh, the Atlanta area has always been a, a hotbed for for athletes. And, and what I like is the fact that when you participate in AAU sports, Pop Warner football or, or volleyball or soccer, you, you don't ever read about kids getting in trouble. You know, we, we, we occupying their time, their minds, uh, their spirits in, in, in activities is something that I, I really embrace. Uh, sometimes there are some negative conversations about AAU ball, which I think is unwarranted because I know those guys make a tremendous amount of sacrifices, spending time with those kids, taking them around and visit all over the country playing ball. 
during the summertime. And to me, I think that's great. I always had mentors, guy AAU type people in a part of my life. And I thought they gave me good direction, kept me occupied, kept me from doing things. Maybe if I had been idle, I probably would get into it. It wasn't, you know, uh, good decisions to make. But I, but I really respect that the AAU basketball people in, in, in the Atlanta area because it's, it's very competitive. You know, you have so many teams, girls, boys. And it's just, it just, in my, my opinion, you learn a lot from interacting with people from different walks of life, different races, uh, uh, you, you travel. It's just good, clean, wholesome. And I, I'm impressed. And uh, I think those guys don't get enough credit for making a contribution uh, to helping young men how, you know, realize their dreams and their futures. Now, Coach, uh, it was March 11th, which is my birthday, when everything kind of went crazy with COVID. Everything got shut down. So for you and your staff and your team, where were you all at when all that happened, and how did that go down for you all as well? Well, obviously, uh, we, we won the ACC regular season last year, and we were primed, I thought, to compete in postseason tournament. And um, going to the ACC tournament, we lost a game uh, to Clemson, and that was our first game in the ACC tournament. But I was starting to feel a little uncomfortable because of – uh, this was the fear of the unknown. And then the night before, the NBA canceled their season, and that got my attention. And then we, it was announced that we would have limited um, fans in the stands uh, at the ACC tournament. Only parents and family members were going to be able to come into you know, and watch the ACC game. Well, my alarm kind of went off. You know, I'm feeling somewhat anxious now because I'm thinking if we got this disease that I had never been exposed to that has caused the NBA to cancel the season and we made a decision to have limited people in the stand, my, it didn't make sense to me that the corona would stay in the empty seats and that there were going to be people in the arena and we were going to be on the court in my mind, is the corona just going to stay on the, off the court? Uh, is it going to be with the referees? Is it going to be with the announcers? And because I, I can't see this, I don't know where, 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 where I could see it. <laughs> so on the bus, I'm feeling uneasy because I'm responsible for my staff and for my team. And I told my staff, I, I didn't see how we were going to be able to play if these issues were on the table. So but we were going, I felt confident that the ACC would make the right decision. If they felt it was safe, it would be safe. I expected them to let us know, and they didn't. So we were in the locker room talking to our players in a pregame talk. I think uh, Clemson had already gone out in the court to, register, to warm up. And they summoned me out of the pregame talk with my players over into the coach's office and say, we don't think this is – we're not going to be able to play. And and I was expecting that and be very honest with you. I was hopeful that that was going to be the case. And so – but I said I didn't want my guys not to get in, in, in have the experience at least going out in the court and warming up and for the ACC because we had a great season. And I, at the time, I did not know that we were – the NCAA tournament would be canceled as well. And so they went out and warmed up and they came back and I let them know uh, that the reason why the, uh, the tournament had been canceled. And my comment to them was that in life, sometime in life, God gives you these bumps in the road to challenge you to see what kind of man you are. Yes, indeed. And I told them that we were going to have more games to play. I would have more games to coach. But if someone was to go on that court and contract the disease and something negative happened to them, the enjoyment and the satisfaction we would get from playing and coaching would be paled in comparison to someone losing their life because they contracted COVID during uh, that event. And that we had to adjust, not feel sorry for ourselves, not be angry, not necessarily be disappointed. This is 
a challenge that we had to deal with as young men and that we had to handle in a more matured way. And that I, I wanted them to understand this was the challenge we had. So uh, let's cherish this moment. Let's be glad that we uh, are healthy and that we have had a great season. And let's pack our bags and let's get back to the hotel, get back to Tallahassee. Let's see whether or not we're going to have an NCAA tournament team. And my team has been focused and they've handled it in a matured way. Because I think we, what we've tried to do is give them reasons why uh, they, this is the time to grow up, mature, and adjust to challenges, this challenge in life. And if this is the only challenge they're going to have in life, they will be very fortunate. You got there, right, Coach. And how was it for your guys academically going from in campus, on campus, in person to virtual, being in their home, back in their home the environment? So how was that for you and your senior staff, your assistant coaches, and your academic advisors to make sure your young men kept the GPAs really high over that spring and semester there? Well, we know we've only had two players not graduate in 18 years we've been here at, at Florida State. In Miami, I was there for 10 years. I've only had three. So in 28 years, we've only had five kids not graduate. Now, that's part of our DNA. That's what we're going to do. We don't accept anything else other than that. We, it's, 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 those are non-negotiables when it comes to taking care of yourself academically and doing the things that you're supposed to do. I, so I, we, we don't have any problem. We made the adjustment because we had to. And, and our guys are maintained. And um, that's uh, the seminal way. Uh, we don't compromise anything when it comes down to academics and preparing yourself so that you can have a better way of life. Uh, then if the parents are going to trust me with their most precious gift, their, their children, then I'm going to treat them like they're my own children. And I'm going to hold them to the same standard and the accountability uh, that their family was expecting. That. And that's where we operate. So we, we, we're doing just fine academic. Now, Coach, for your, for your young men, uh, we know this summer was very bad with a lot of social justice stuff, trying to keep you registered to vote and all things going on around our country. How did you use the opportunity via the Zoom and the, your wisdom to help our, your young men navigate this tough time we had this summer with the summer of social justice and this reckoning we have in our, have in our country right now? There's no question that this was a challenging uh, period in our lives uh, where, I, you know, I think the, the, I call them demons that just raise their ugly head and challenge you, your emotions, your intelligence, uh, your manhood, your maturity, and uh, you can lose all kinds of sense of reality when you don't look at it and evaluate for what it is. Uh, the challenges that we face in the summer is a manifestation of a lot of things that have been going on for years. And, and, and uh, it's unfortunate that these things happen. And I'm hopeful that as a result of what we've had to endure uh, politically, that the changes have been made politically, that it has brought something attention to an issue that I think we, we should be given more attention. We, and, and we should address them in so many different ways. And hopefully we'll be better moving forward. It's easy to be angry. It's easy to be disappointed. But uh, sometimes when you try to make, be rational on irrational things, Sir. You, you get you get disappointed. So, um, we, we ho hopefully we we've all learned from the state of affairs now, and hopefully some of the negative things have been highlighted that we need to deal with. I think it's obvious it's been on the lips of everybody. I thought our our, our election was a mandate it was a it was what the way it played itself out it was obvious that america wants to change now even though it was split down it was pretty close in terms of um, people who stuck with our president and the president administration and I, and I don't ever want i don't ever want to get into politics but i think that the mere fact that it's been the first time that we've 
we didn't have an incumbent president at least have two terms says a lot about where the majority of America, what they're thinking. And so I'm hopeful that we, as we move forward, uh, we will eliminate some of these negative issues that we've dealt with. But they've been around for years and uh, they're not going away unless we come up with a, we all start having some serious discussions. You know, we gotta have some conversations about why we at this place and then we gotta evaluate what's best for us as a, as a society uh, the, the best way to handle this and how we're going to move forward and get rid of this division, this this uh, mindset of jealousy and disrespect and uh, anger and hatred and jealousy. We, that's, I, I, don't, I just think we're better than this. And, and I'm hopeful uh, that uh, we'll start giving this more serious consideration and realize that it's not going to go away unless we make this a priority. Most definitely. I have two more for you, Coach. Uh, what was about Black Coach United? I, I saw where Paul Hewitt, former coach at Georgia Tech here, saw all these organizations you're part of, Toby Smith is part of, it, Damon Sotomayor, uh, a lot of different guys in the business who are African Americans in this part of organization. So talk about what you all mission is going forward, what y'all going to do for the college basketball coaches in America and in your players as well. I, I think that uh, you need to have an open ear. It's good that we have a lot of experienced guys in the organization that can identify. Uh, I think that we, we, get, we need to be an organization that with some of the experienced guys uh, make it, make ourselves available for some of the younger guys who want to be in some of these head coaching positions, uh, to be available to be mentors and um, examples for them to follow. You know, the, mentorship is a very powerful, powerful uh, thing that I think sometimes positive mentorship is, is missing sometimes in our community. And we want, we want to have a positive effect, not only on the game, but for those guys who are interested in becoming coaches and, and doing it the right way. Um, and so I, I'm, I'm Paul here is giving the organization tremendous leadership. I think uh, in his, in, under his direction that um, the, the organization would grow and be more instrumental in, in, in contributing to uh, this uh, climate that we uh, are addressing now. So I've known Paul for a long time. He's a committed community relation guy. Not only is a good coach, and good, uh, it's a great person that he'll give the organization the type of direction that it needs in order to make an impact uh, on, on our society. Last one for you, Coach. What is your favorite thing to do when you come to Atlanta, Coach? You go to eat when you come here, go out to the mall. Uh, what is your favorite thing to do when you're here in Atlanta? And I ask you, what is your favorite restaurant here in the ATL? A lot of these places eat here. What do you love to eat here when you're in town, Coach? Well, you know, it's, you know, we're all creatures of habit, okay? Yes, sir. <laughs> and, um, we won the ACC tournament in 2012 in Atlanta, and we ate in the we ate at the same restaurant three days in a row. Wow. And the night before, we got to go, go for the championship game. Bernard James said, "Coach, can we eat somewhere?" <laughs> <laughs> one, of, one of my favorite spots in Atlanta is, is Merrimax, and uh, on Ponce de Leon. Yes, sir. And uh, is the restaurant is one of my because it was almost like a thousand grandmothers got together and they they they, they pooled their best recipes and they put them in that kitchen over there and and every time I go to Atlanta I try to schedule all my appointments and meetings and games around the most important thing is stopping by Miramax <laughs> so there are times. If I have two meetings, I'll schedule one an early lunch and another one an early dinner, and they both be in Merrimack. And sometimes one of the waitresses say, didn't I see you earlier? I say, don't tell anybody. <laughs> <laughs> no, no uh, Merrimack has just been sold to um, a gentleman there in, in um in Atlanta that um, 
that I'm anxious to meet, but uh, the former uh, owner was a Florida State graduate from down here near Wakulla, outside of Tallahassee. I didn't know that when I started going there. Matter of fact, if I remember correctly, it might have been Paul Heard and George Ravelin that maybe took me there for my, my first time. That was in, I want to say 2002, maybe 2002, or spring of 2002, when I took the job at Florida State. So I've been going there ever since. So Mary Max is my spot now. Believe me, there are so many wonderful places in Atlanta to, to eat at. But, um, you know, that, that that's one of my favorite. I understand there are several other, what you call Southern cuisine restaurants that I'm gonna have to go visit. A couple of new just popped up in the last couple of years. I haven't had a chance. But uh, believe me, next time we're on the radio show, maybe I might uh, give you a little update on, uh, on, uh, on some of the restaurants. I'm, you know, by being raised, being raised in the South, uh, I'm, I'm more of a Southern cuisine type guy. Believe me, and you guys got all these fancy restaurants in there. Where yes. you gotta wear shoes, coats and ties. And you gotta be all sophisticated. That's what yeah, you I'm coming with my, yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm rolling with the cornbread, the collard greens, rice and gravy, cream corn, okra and tomatoes. That's what I'm interested in. Uh, kind of like uh, grandma's cooking, you know. That's that's Coach Ham. <laughs> Uh, Coach, when you come to town, man, I will take you to some spots I love and show you some new spots that I tend to enjoy, Coach. I would love to do that for you, man. <laughs> uh, look, like, look like to me you, have, you haven't you missed very many meals. I have not, Coach. <laughs> I <have> not. <laughs> Since I retired, uh, yeah. you know, I already missed many, tell, man. Hey, look, I can tell by your point guard shooting 5'10 guard used to be a parent that uh, <laughs> you, you, uh, you do uh, enjoy – uh, a, a good meal. See? You got that right, yeah, Coach. <laughs> hey, <laughs> since I retired, Coach, hey, I, so I don't go to the gym anymore like I used to. I let it go, man. I like, I'm enjoying this for now. I don't have, have to hold back anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 listen now, you might you might have to give me your phone number because look now, you just said something. I'm going to tell your listeners, your viewing audience, you said you're going to take me to a couple spots there. I'm going to hold you to that. Hey, you Coach, know? we get off this tape, and I'm going to give you my phone number so you can have it. Hey, Coach, hey, I'm a man of my word. That's what I tell you, Coach. I'm a man of my word, Coach. I will do that. <laughs> Listen, I got about 7,000 numbers in here. I'm going to put a star by yours. You know what I mean? <laughs> Important. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Well, Coach, before you, I'm going to get you them off, off the air here real shortly. But, folks, it's Leonard Havel of the Boss Man Show. It's been fun to talk to you, Coach. I couldn't do this again with you. It's been so amazing to get you on the show, man. I'm, I've been enjoying this whole, whole time with you this afternoon, Coach. It's been great. But listen, now, one thing you got, my, my man, uh, Devin Vassell's from Atlanta. Y'all got to show him a little love. Now, he's going to be a lottery pick, and y'all should be giving him a little love around Atlanta. Because he represents, and he's from Atlanta. Uh, great, came to Florida State, played well. No, not very many people knew about him. But in the next 10 or 15 years, y'all need to get to know him because he's a guy from Atlanta. He's going to make y'all very proud. I sure will, Coach. Hey, Coach, you trust me. Any guys you want me on the show, Coach, I'll make that happen, Coach. You know, I, 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 I am the booker here. I, I book the show and host it, so I can get anybody. I won't, if you want him on the show, Coach, I'll get, I'll get it done for you. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to repeat. I'm available 24 hours a day. And if I'm asleep, you can wake me up. <laughs> yes, indeed. Leonard Hamilton, the Boston Show people. Check him out. Full of safe symbols, guys. <laughs>